It is my pleasure this morning to introduce our first speaker, Father Joseph Giroux. He studied at Wadham's Hall in the Pontif Pontifical North American College in Rome. He also completed his license in sacramental theology at the Pontifical Athenaeum of St. Anselmo in Rome. Father Giroux has served in parishes throughout the diocese and is currently pastor of the Malone Catholic Parishes. It is with pleasure that I welcome Father Joseph Giroux, who will present on Vatican II's Constitution on the Liturgy. Father Giroux. Good morning again. Good morning. I know it did my heart good, and I imagine even more so for Monsignor Riani to have that chapel full of people and voices this morning, filled with prayer once again. So let's begin our day together in prayer. What in the world is going on here? When a non-Catholic wanders into one of our churches during Mass, that's their first question, right? What in the world is going on here? This reality has provided ample fodder for comics over the years. Ever heard of Larry the Cable Guy? <laughs> you never thought you'd hear his name in church this morning, did you? <laughs> Larry has a sketch where he talks about going with a friend to Mass and not realizing he was out for an exercise routine. Boy, you gotta be in shape to go there, he says. Down, up, sit down, stand up. Do a shot, kneel down, stand up. <laughs> what in the world is going on here? Pursuing a more sincere answer to that question has been known to provoke not belly-shaking laughter, but heart-changing conversion. Dr. Scott Hahn frequently tells a story from back when he was still a rather anti-Catholic Presbyterian minister. I quietly slipped into the basement chapel, he says. They were having a new mass, and I had never gone to mass before. I sat down in the back pew. I didn't kneel. I didn't genuflect. I wouldn't stand. I was an observer. I was there to watch. Then a bell rang, and they all stood up, and Mass began. I had never seen it before. They read more scripture, I thought, in a weekday Mass than we read in a Sunday service. Their prayers were soaked with biblical language and phrases. Wow! It's like the Bible coming to life and dancing out on the center stage and saying, this is where I belong. What in the world is going on here? I propose it was in an attempt to answer that very question that the fathers of the Second Vatican Council approved the very first of the Council's 16 documents. When most Catholics think of Vatican II, they think of Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, solemnly promulgated on December 4th, 1963, just 10 days shy of 50 years ago. Why is this the first they think of? Well, for one thing, of all the conciliar documents, it made the most obvious difference in the average Catholic's life. It brought about significant changes in the celebration of the Mass. Latin turned into English, the priests turned around at the altar, and choirs singing to the organ turned into folk groups strumming guitars. <laughs> <laughs> or at least that's the common perception of what Vatican II did for the Church's worship. But the Constitution on the liturgy stands out for other reasons, too. In many ways, it was programmatic of everything else the Council set out to accomplish. In other words, Beyond liturgical reform, it revealed the Council's wider agenda. In its very first paragraph, it announces to the Church and to the world that this Sacro Sanctum Concilium 
this most sacred council has set out to reinvigorate the Catholic faithful in living the Christian life, to adapt those aspects of the church which can be changed to the needs of the modern age, to promote greater unity among all who believe in Christ, and to call all mankind anew to enter the church's fold. Clearly, that was quite an ambitious agenda. <clears throat> Much like the preview shown before the feature film, the Constitution on the Liturgy also gives us many hints of the coming attractions from this council. It speaks repeatedly of the church's true and essential nature, as will the dogmatic Constitution on the church, Lumen Gentium. It speaks repeatedly of the church as a sign lifted up among the nations, as will the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes. And it speaks repeatedly of the centrality of sacred tradition and sacred scripture in the life of the church, as will the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum. Sacrosanctum Concilium is able to bear the burden of such weighty themes because its subject is the very summit toward which all of the Church's activity is directed, and the very source from which all her power flows, the sacred liturgy, in particular, the Most Holy Eucharist. <laughs> It could be tempting, of course, to assume that it was for such lofty reasons that this was the first document to be issued by Vatican II. But according to the recollections of an up-and-coming German theologian who assisted at the council, a certain Father Joseph Ratzinger, the bishop's motivation was much more mundane. This was by far the least controversial subject on the table and the preparatory work had been more carefully carried out. That's not to say the text was without debate. Discussion on the draft dragged on for three weeks, with more than 600 interventions by the bishops, whether spoken from the floor or submitted in writing. But in the final voting, it passed by a landslide. 2,147 in favor, only four against. Don't ask for their names. <laughs> <laughs> to better understand where the Constitution on the Liturgy is coming from and why it was approved by such a wide margin, I think a little background is helpful. First, we need to be aware of the wider con context of the Council itself. In contrast to the previous 20 ecumenical councils recognized by Catholics, Vatican II was not convened in reaction to a particular crisis or attack on the Church, such as the Council of Trent following the Protestant Reformation. Instead, Blessed Pope John XXIII called the world's bishops to Rome with the intention of bringing the Church into dialogue with the modern world. The problem wasn't that doctrine or discipline were being aggressively challenged by forces inside or outside the Church. The problem was that contemporary men and women were finding it increasingly difficult to see these things as truly relevant to their daily lives. So the Council's entire tone would be different from those of the past, focused less on dogma and rules for enforcement, and more on an appropriate pastoral response to the needs of the day. <clears throat> That is to say, Vatican II wanted to make it easier for people, Catholics or otherwise, when they looked at the church, to answer that probing question, what in the world is going on here? This had been a particular concern for some time when it came to the church's liturgy. Following the so-called Age of Enlightenment and the many violent revolutions it sparked, Traditionally, Christian regions of Europe found the church and its influence becoming increasingly marginalized. Likewise, Catholic liturgy, for a variety of reasons, 
had been reduced by and large to minimal forms. Something the priest did at the altar, with the assistance of a few altar boys at most, entirely in Latin, accepting the sermon when there was one, while the faithful in attendance occupied themselves with other devotional practices, very few of them even regularly coming forward to receive Holy Communion. Something needed to be done to revive the faith, and it was believed, by a few hardy souls anyway, that the best way to renew this church was to renew her worship. So very quietly, a movement began the liturgical movement. It started in France, but spread across the European continent, and then to North America. It originated in monasteries, but gradually moved into parishes. Scholars dug deep into the history of the liturgy, hoping to recover its original vitality. The designs of church buildings, priestly vestments, and sacred vessels began to reflect their discoveries returning to a noble simplicity after much Baroque excess. The clergy were encouraged to go beyond a merely mechanical obedience to the rubrics and the bare minimum required at that, and instead appropriate the true spirit of the liturgy. And such a liturgical spirituality was promoted for the laity as well, moving them from being passive spectators on the sidelines being genuine participants, from praying at Mass to praying the Mass. It was believed that by drawing people more deeply into the sacred mysteries, not only the Church, but also culture and society at large, could be transformed. As the liturgical movement grew, it gained momentum, attention, support at the highest level. Pope Leo XIII permitted missiles to be printed in the vernacular so that people could follow the text of the Mass in their own language. Pope St. Pius X encouraged frequent reception of Holy Communion beginning at an early age rather than what had become customary just once a year. He also restored Gregorian chant, the native music of the Roman liturgy, meant to be sung by all, which had over time been replaced by devotional hymns or performance pieces sung by a choir. Pope Pius XI endorsed the Dialogue Mass, during which the entire congregation responded to the prayers, not just the altar boys. And Pope Pius XII didn't simply publish an entire encyclical Mediator Dei devoted to the liturgy, but put theory into practice as we heard last night by beginning the reform of the liturgies of Holy Week in the early 1950s. 150 years of groundwork had been carefully laid before the world's bishops assembled at Vatican II. Sacrosanctum Concilium tells us quite explicitly that its purpose is twofold. The promotion and the restoration of the sacred liturgy. <clears throat> the liturgy, like the church and like her founder, is essentially both human and divine, made up of visible, physical elements which are directed toward and subordinate to invisible, spiritual realities. Thus we have first Promotion. The council calling the church to look under the hood <laughs> of the liturgy. To become familiar with that which God is accomplishing unseen. To recognize at the deepest level what in the world is really going on here. And we also have, secondly, restoration. Taking the liturgy to the body shop. So to make sure that the rest of the vehicle, its sensible, tangible components, are truly worthy of its engine. Constitution on the liturgy's intent is to ensure that what is happening outwardly in the church's worship 
is a clear and faithful expression of what is going on deep within her. Promotion of the liturgy, getting inside of it, was the chief preoccupation of the liturgical movement, and is, no surprise, the chief preoccupation of this document, too. The Council Fathers remind us that the apostles, sent forth by Christ, didn't just preach about his death and resurrection. The Word continued to become flesh, as it were. When those who believed were baptized and broke the bread in the Lord's Supper. And each new generation of believers has gone out to the world with more than just a spoken message of good news, but with the living and active presence of Him who is the source, center, and substance of that gospel. Sacrosanctum Concilium highlights four modes in which Christ is present in the church's liturgy. Christ is present first and foremost in the Mass, in the person of the priest, and above all, in the sacred species of the Most Holy Eucharist. Christ is present in the celebration of the other sacraments. Christ is present when the Scriptures are proclaimed. And Christ is present when the church gathers to sing and pray in his name. Because Jesus Christ is one body with his bride, the church, his presence permeating her so intimately and completely, the head and members cannot act apart from one another. Accordingly, under signs that can be seen and heard, touched and tasted, and yes, even smell, the world's salvation and sanctification, the fruit of the dying and rising of the Son of God, continues to be worked out in the liturgy. While it is not the whole of her activity, nonetheless, no other action of the church can equal it. The spiritual life of the faithful is certainly not limited to the liturgy. <coughs> However, all true devotion must necessarily be in harmony with it. In order for the liturgy to be effective, for this unseen presence to change the world, we can see, it is crucial for us to be properly disposed, that we be aware of what we're doing, that our minds be in tune with our voices, that we be engaged in and enriched by the ritual action. That we cooperate with heavenly grace, lest we receive it in vain. If Christ is really and truly present in the liturgy, then, by golly, we need to be really and truly present, too. Therefore, in what are probably the most powerful words of the entire Constitution. Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that full, conscious, and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy, and to which the Christian people have a right and obligation. Participation whether as a noun or a verb, the word shows up 28 times in the Constitution. We, the baptized, are duty-bound to take part, to involve ourselves in a manner that is full, engaging the whole person, both bodily and spiritually, inside and out, in a manner that is conscious, knowing as best we're able just what it is that we're doing and active. Active here requires some extra explanation. The original Latin expression is participatio actuosa. It usually gets translated as active participation, which is generally taken to mean engaging people through songs, responses, gestures, or 
and in number of ministries. It puts the accent on giving people something to do. But such an understanding is only partly right. A more accurate translation, although admittedly it sounds rather poor in English, is actual participation, which sets a much higher standard. Engaging not just people's bodies, but their minds, their hearts, and their wills. It's not so much about getting folks to do something, as it is getting folks to allow Christ to act, to allow Christ to do something through, with, and in them. That really raises the bar, doesn't it? It's essential, we're told, that the church's pastors be properly trained, making sure that they understand this. Because fostering this sort of participation is one of their chief responsibilities. The council is calling Catholics at every level to be completely awake to what in the world is going on here. So much for looking under the hood. Now that we know that the liturgy isn't a model straight out of the Flintstones, <laughs> one we have to power ourselves, but instead is an engine all souped up and turbocharged by the presence and action of Christ, it's time to see what shape the rest of this vehicle is in. Before getting into the specific bodywork the bishops had in mind, about changes to be made in the liturgy, particularly the Mass, Sacrosanctum Concilium lays down some ground rules. <coughs> the liturgy is made up of both unchangeable elements and elements which can be, maybe even ought to be, changed. It's absolutely crucial to recognize the difference, which is why the liturgy is regulated by the Church's highest authority, the Pope, and in certain cases, the bishops. Nobody, and for some reason, it singles out us priests, not nobody is to tinker with it on his own. Which is meant to guarantee that any changes in the liturgy are in line with the church's tradition. While this restoration ought to take into account contemporary experience, changes must be preceded by careful study organically flow from existing forms and be made only if the good of the church requires it. And in the church's tradition, few things are more important than sacred scripture, which has a central part to play in the liturgy. If we're going to promote and restore the liturgy, then we must do so loving the sacraments. The liturgy is both hierarchical and communal. Changes must make it clear that liturgical rites are never private functions, but the celebration of the whole church. Each person, whether clergy or lay, ought to be fully engaged in his or her proper role, but only in that role. In other words, be sure you're doing your job, and don't go trying to take anybody else's. The liturgy is both instructive and pastoral. In the liturgy, God speaks to his people, his people respond. In order to make sure that this communication is clear, when it comes to rituals, they should be marked by a noble simplicity and not be so complicated that they cannot be easily understood. When it comes to texts, the scriptures should be read more, preaching should be improved, and appropriate liturgical instruction should be provided. And when it comes to language, Latin is still the first choice and is to be preserved. But local languages have a very valuable place. The liturgy can and even should be adapted to the temperaments and traditions of particular peoples. This expressed a concern especially for mission lands. Local customs could be incorporated 
as long as substantial unity was preserved with the rest of the church. In other words, the bishops are saying there's a way for the liturgy to be both properly Roman and truly Catholic, that is, universal. The liturgy of the bishop, surrounded by his priests and people in his cathedral, is the principal manifestation of the local church, and therefore must be held in the highest esteem. But since the bishop can't be everywhere, although ours seems to be trying to prove otherwise, <laughs> the liturgical life of the parish is also of great importance. For this reason, national and diocesan commissions on liturgy and sacred art should be established to promote the needed renewal. From these eight general principles, Council Fathers move on to specific reforms. Here's where the rubber hits the road. They begin at the top with the Mass, outlining nine concrete mandates. First, that the rites of the Mass be simplified by removing unnecessary repetitions and bringing back unfortunate losses, all the while preserving their substance. Second, that more of the Bible be read at Mass, and the readings be arranged in a cycle laid out over several years. Third, that the homily be seen as an essential part of the Mass, be more carefully prepared to be omitted only for serious reasons. Fourth, that the prayer of the faithful be restored after disappearing many centuries before. Fifth, that local languages may be used for the readings, the prayer of the faithful, and the people's parts. The folks still ought to know these parts in Latin. Sixth, that it's preferable for people to receive hosts consecrated at the same Mass they are attending, rather than from the previous one. Seventh, that Holy Communion may be distributed under both kinds on a few special occasions. Eighth, that people be helped to understand that the Mass is composed of two parts, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist and that they really should be there for all of both. <laughs> There's a problem then, and we haven't fixed that one yet. <laughs> Nine. <coughs> that in celebration, multiple priests offering one and the same Mass be permitted. Nothing too earth-shattering in that list. In fact, what's surprising 50 years later is all that's not there. There's nothing about turning the altar around or strumming on guitars. The door is open to allowing English at Mass, but alongside Latin, not instead of it. There's no mention of moving the tabernacle or communion in the hands. Such changes and their associated controversies would come a little farther down the line, after the Council as a result of things this Constitution set in motion, or how it was being interpreted. Sacrosanctum Concilium continues for several more chapters, doing for the rest of the liturgy... Well, how do you get in there? <laughs> That's Fidelli Cat, our mascot for the Year of Faith in Malone. I guess he wanted to make one more public appearance before the year was over. <laughs> the Constitution went on to do for the rest of the liturgy what it had done for the Mass, for the other sacraments and sacramentals, for the divine office, for the calendar of seasons and saints, for sacred music, art, and furnishings. It wanted to do for these just as it had done with Mass, restorations far too numerous to be discussed now. All of them intended to help us have a better sense of what is going on here. So how did the Constitution on the Liturgy do? At the 50-year mark, many people are rejoicing, and rightly so. Look how far we've come. 
When a half century ago, we only had altar boys, ushers, and a choir. And now we've got permanent deacons, readers, and extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion, greeters, art, and environment committees. New liturgical music, praise God, of increasing quality, is being published all the time. We've seen a lot of changes, a lot of growth, and a lot of it's been so very good. But this optimism must also be tempered by an honest examination of conscience. Because if the founders of the liturgical movement, people holy, learned, and wise, believed that the best way to renew the church was to renew her worship, then why aren't our pews overflowing? One reason might be the law of unintended consequences. Things you don't have to be a scholar to recognize and lament. In the desire to simplify the rites of the church and make them more accessible, some symbols have been minimalized or even lost. Catholics used to be known for smells and bells. <laughs> now many parishes lack both. Not wanting to be preoccupied with details, Reverent ceremonial has given way to a rather casual, sometimes even sloppy, approach. One which fails to point to these as truly sacred mysteries. Every few weeks, I see a letter to the editor of the Plattsburgh Press Republican complaining that altar servers are misbehaving. Not, I tell you, like my sons back in the day. <laughs> Openings for creativity and adaptation have left some congregations subject to the changing whims and fancies of individuals, usually their pastors, committees, or the latest trend promoted by the experts. Meant to include more of the faithful, this has generally alienated or at least confused a greater number than it involved. I know of a community where Catholics celebrate Advent in purple at one end of town, and in blue at the other. And moving the celebrant to the other side of the altar has put more focus on the priest, his person and his personality, not less. There can be no mistaking any of these things for authentic renewal. But I think our real difficulty it's far more elementary than all of that. I think that we got so very busy restoring the liturgy that we failed to really promote it. So much time and energy was invested in hubcaps and hood ornaments, racing stripes and fuzzy dice, <laughs> whether stripping off the old ones or putting on new ones, that we neglected to pay much mind to what was going on under the hood. And in the end, what a vehicle looks like pales in importance when compared to whether or not it will take you where you hope to go. If we don't know what we are celebrating, better yet, if we don't know who we are celebrating, then how can we ever know how to celebrate? Almost exactly 50 years ago, the Second Vatican Council promulgated a document that brought about very noticeable changes in the way Catholics worship. With the urgent needs of the new evangelization, I think we'd do well to spend the next 50 years focused less on the mandate of restoration and more on the mandate to promote the liturgy. When anguished parishioners speak to me of family members or friends who no longer practice the faith or have left the church altogether, they frequently ask, how could they walk away from the Eucharist? I think the more pressing question is, did they ever really understand it? Did they have any good idea what in the world is going on here? The liturgy, 
like the church to which it has been entrusted, is a living organism. Living things change. With the proper care, they flourish and grow. Neglected, they wither and decay. Regardless, they will change. And the only time they will stop changing is when they've died. And this living, changing relationship between the church and her worship, it's critical that we remember. It's not so much that Christians make and remake the liturgy. It's that the liturgy makes and remakes Christians. The first document of the Second Vatican Council sought to reinvigorate to give new vitality, to bring new life to the church by promoting and restoring her liturgy. To that I say a hearty amen. May it be so.